Hello, and welcome to the Catching the Octopus podcast. Here, we will explore how connecting inward gives us an advantage outward. We openly talk about the obstacles and challenges and difficulties that life throws our way and how they become moments of gratitude and things that can benefit us when we look back on our lives. I'm your host, Naomi Hurley, and it is my mission to bring you top quality guests that will share with you openly their obstacles and also the techniques they use to go inward that strengthens the way that they serve themselves and others at the highest level. Thank you for joining. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. Today we have Dr. Nick Mabbott and Dr. Nick and I have connected through his knowledge of fatigue. So he's a fatigue risk management specialist and pretty much I think knows nearly everything all to do with sleep. So um, welcome Dr. Nick, thanks for coming along. Thank you Naomi and um, yes although I like to believe I I know almost all there is to know about sleep and managing fatigue but um, I get the odd shock here and there and hear something new and I think, well, we're going to add this to the arsenal. Um, (laughs) And the bag of tools is very heavy, which is a good thing. Um, My biggest problem is when I'm delivering training sessions, I hardly ever get enough time to talk about everything that people need to know. Yeah, I've got to say, I've just come back an hour ago from delivering training at um, where, uh, sorry, Boddington Borks Art Mine. Yep. And that's one of my really good clients um, for a number of reasons. But the thing I really love is they let me talk for four hours instead of only two or three. Yeah. And I haven't done this for a while. And when I walked away from today's session, I felt really good because four hours of communicating some really amazing knowledge with these people who were just soaking it up. And we had a really good mix of people backgrounds in nursing who after the session said I'm going to talk to um, some people I know in training in health and try and get you in front of some nurses because they need your help Um, another one was an ex long distance truck driver and he said wow I have spent years looking after myself on the road I wish I had met you earlier (laughs) yeah for sure so um, could you, for the listeners, could you give us a bit of an introduction, a bit of a background on yourself so they know who you are? Sure. I've uh, got a Bachelor of Psychology and a Doctor of Philosophy in Psychology. And the work there was on development of a fatigue monitoring system for haul truck drivers. This was uh, way back in the early 2000s. Um, <laughs> and through building that technology, I had the opportunity to do some wonderful research, including Um, monitoring the performance of employees driving 12-hour night shifts for 14 nights in a row and so on. And the learnings from that experiment was just incredible because what you get to see is the real data on real people doing real people things. Um, And I've always learned from the research and then talking to real people that a lot of the theories don't quite fit because people will do their own thing. And what we learned in 2003 through some of that research and other research was that 20% of your workforce will give you roughly 80% of your critical fatigue alarms. And if you fix that 20%, you've got a very safe, healthy and happy workforce. So one of the other things I do is delivery of usually three hour training sessions, sometimes four hours, um, sometimes a bit less, um, but I do whatever I can to try and get the vital messages across Um, And so far, I've been fortunate enough to be in front of more than 32,000 people. And we discuss the science of sleep, all of the wonderful things that you get out of sleep, such as cleaning your brain, developing fuel for the next day, learning, remembering, sorting problems out, getting rid of um, nasty toxins from your head so that when you're my age, nearly 64, you don't have to worry quite so much about aging brain diseases. And that's what I love about knowing what I know, because if I at least walk or move for 30 minutes every day and eat my really healthy Mediterranean style diet with all the different colored veggies to get different vitamins and minerals um, and sleep like an absolute champ, if if you could get a medal for good sleep, I reckon I'd be there. Um, (laughs) So I'm doing the three basic needs 
to keep a good healthy brain as I get older. Yeah, um, that's really helpful, isn't it? With um, there's so much going on in our world, and I know there's so many people that struggle with sleep. So I'm I'm very lucky. Oh, yeah. I'm one of those people that will just sleep when I need to. So I get lots yeah. and lots of sleep, which is okay. great. But um, can you give us give us some benefits, especially around you know leaders sometimes can be stressed, and I hear mm. people saying I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, and you know can you give um sort Absolutely. of your take on that? I, I do actual separate sessions for leaders. Um, I have a training course that is um, de designed to suit everybody, and that's the basic information around sleep, hygiene, and all of the good things you need to be a perfect human being. For supervisors and managers and any sort of leader, they often take their troubles, issues, concerns to bed with them. Mm. Some of them have trouble getting to sleep because their brain is going at 100 miles an hour. For them, I suggest half an hour before bed, brain dump, get yourself a pen on pad, write down what you have to do tomorrow. Because when you wake up through the night as a leader, you can guarantee it's your brain saying, don't forget to do this tomorrow. Yeah. And don't forget that what's his name has to take time off and you've got to organize that and things like that. Um, if you wake up during the night and think those things, again, roll over, write it down so that you can clear it out of your brain. You know subconsciously then you can't forget it if it's on paper go back to sleep and very importantly when you are laying there thinking if you're thinking for more than 10 minutes get out of bed pick up a boring book and read that get those thoughts out of your brain read the book until you feel sleepy enough to go back to bed um, I actually do a bit of sleep coaching with people who have what we call sleep maintenance insomnia yep and a lot of that comes about from either not handling shift work well or from being a leader and years ago, I had this chap who was a truck driver turned leader, not quite given the skills he needed to support himself as a leader. Happens often. <laughs> quite often the case. Hey, you drive a truck really good. You must be a good leader. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Seen that before. Anyway, yeah. He come to me after a while and said, look, I'm struggling on three hours sleep a night. Oh. And if I could go into that case just briefly, yeah. I gave him a sleep diary. He filled it in. And when I got it back, I saw that um, this gentleman was getting one sleep cycle of 90 minutes, waking up in REM sleep, thinking about stuff. Mm. He would then lay there and agonize over what's going on, his problems at work, because once upon a time, he could go home, go to bed and not think about work. But now he's got budgets, uh, timelines. He's working with people. Um, <laughs> That can be very interesting at times. A bit like sure. herding cats. Yeah. <laughs> and people are so, so um, challenging because when, and, and maybe you can confirm this, but when we don't get enough sleep, then our tolerance is reduced and our resilience and our agility. So look, continue with your story, but tell us how we kind of dealt with all of that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. We do, just, just to add to what you said, we become lesser human beings. <laughs> mm. um, and what I worked out with this gentleman was he had over the years, taught himself that when we're when you're in bed, you should be awake mm -hmm. because the majority of his night was laying in bed awake. Um, now, I introduced what we call bed restriction therapy. Um, and that means you should only be in bed when you're asleep or doing one other thing we don't talk about on podcasts. <laughs> Thanks for keeping it clean, Dr. Nick. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> no um, and I, I said to this gentleman, what you have to do is rewire your brain. First, I will let you know that your brain is very plastic. Your brain has the ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And based on that, you need to understand that because you were going to bed, getting one and a half hours of sleep, and then waking up and laying there, as long as you're laying there awake, you are teaching your brain at that point, bed is for being awake. And now we need to unlearn this. So here, here are the rules that you need to put in place. 30-minute walk every morning. That gets you some synthesizing vitamin D, which is good for your mental health. It also gets you active, which is good for promoting deep sleep. On top of that, I want you to organize healthy meals every day because we know very strongly that good gut biomes mm. equals both good mental health and good sleep health. Straight away, he did both of those things. And then I said, right, now here's the hard part. Every time you wake up, try and go back to sleep. Don't concern about it. Don't worry or stress. If you can't get back to bed in 10 minutes or can't get back to sleep, I should say, you get out of bed and read a boring book until you feel that sleepy, you have to go back to bed. Yeah. And he said, well, what's that going to do for me? I said, when you are out of bed and awake, you are unlearning that you should be awake in bed. Oh, okay. 
And when do I go back to bed? When you feel sleepy. And then when you get back in bed and you get to sleep instantly, when you're asleep and in bed, neurons that fire together, wire together, yep. your brain will reassociate the good habit of when we're in bed, we sleep. After two and a half weeks, this gentleman got back to me and said, hey, I'm up to three books a week. <laughs> He's still he awake. Hadn't, right? He hadn't read a book in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, wow, you are working hard. Keep going because you've got 15 years of poor sleep to fix up. Mm -hmm. It may take a while, but keep working hard. And between you and me, we'll get a breakthrough. After six weeks, I got an email from this gentleman saying, hey, doc, seven hours and 20 minutes without a single wake up. Yay. And I went, yes. And I still have that email six years later. Yeah, nice. And, <laughs> you know, I, I pick up and I think I've mentioned this to you before, you know, with my daughter and you know, she'll be playing electronics or something on her bed in a room. And I'm like, no, get off. And it's not get off the electronics, it's get off the bed, right? Like yes. you just, um, and I think maybe that's why I just sleep so well. I've only ever gone to my bed for those two things, right? Um, yes. So my brain knows Fantastic. exactly that it's time to sleep. And and I do this and I, and I also speak with clients about this as well, setting yourself up for success. You know, when I meditate, I meditate yes. in the same chair at the same time. My brain goes, oh, we're meditating now, right? So yep. the brain's not as smart as we think it is really, is it? Mm. <laughs> it, it constantly requires training and retraining. Mm. And it's so easy to slip into bad habits. Um, let, me, let me tell you another thing that a lot of people unknowingly do. Yeah. Um, again, a little bit of information completely fixes us people and this is why i love what i do because every day that i'm training i get so many light bulbs come on and people going oh wow where were you 20 years ago um best example is some people sit on the lounge watching tv with their partner with all the lights on tv blaring and they fall asleep and then their mm -hmm. partner leans over and taps them on the shoulder and says oi wake up go to bed they get up they go to bed and they can't sleep for an hour and they just lay there miserable and grumpy at their partner for waking them up. Yeah. Interestingly, that same person on a different night can go to bed really tired, but not sleepy. We call that tired, but wired. And we've all been there. Uh, that's where you may have been awake too long, or you might not have had enough sleep the night before. You've built up a lot of cortisol in your brain and too much cortisol wires you in a way that it's very hard to get to sleep until you get to a very small part of time i call it the gateway to sleep um, and anyone who's done my training learns that 16 hours and 10 minutes after you wake up your body clock in your brain switches off and when it switches off it stops looking for light cues which is why you can fall asleep in front of the tv mm. now what switches that off is that wonderful hormone melatonin yeah a lot of people don't know that that's what it does the trouble is the theory on melatonin output is roughly 16 hours after you wake up, you get a dose of it that builds up through the night. Now, I'm calling that incorrect because what I've realized over the years I've been doing this, and especially the last 14 years where I come up with this theory on absolute sleep timing, 16 hours and 10 minutes after you wake up, it would take a few minutes, you get your first release of melatonin, which turns out the body clock, turns it down. It allows you to get to sleep, but that first dose doesn't last all night. It's about five minutes worth, and that's it. And then it's gone, and then your body clock turns back on looking for light. And you might be in your bed with everything turned off, and if there's one little LED in the ceiling or on the air conditioner, it annoys the hell out of you because your brain is reading it going, must be awake. I, I call that first five minutes worth your gateway to sleep. Following that for about an hour is a forbidden zone. And if you don't catch that first five minutes, you've got to wait roughly an hour before you get your next dose. And if you don't, if you're in bed for that hour, tossing and turning and getting grumpy, you often get sleep anxiety, which is one of the worst things for sleep. Mm. You get that worried about not sleeping. You can't sleep. Yeah, I've seen where, that before as well in people where, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And because the brain, you know, the brain the, where focus goes, energy flows, right? So mm -hmm. if you start Absolutely. worrying about not being able to go to sleep, that just compounds the problem, doesn't it? It certainly does. It makes it bigger than men here. <laughs> no, but I think that's that that's the whole thing, isn't it? You know, sleep's underestimated and 
um, and you can talk more to this because you're probably more of a specialist in this area, but it improves memory. It improves cognition. Um, it improves your body health. It helps your muscles um, rejuvenate does. and recover. And, and there's so yep. many benefits to it that people just don't realize. Yeah. And, you know, take a leaf out of Usain Bolt's book, for example, most super athletes like him need nine hours of sleep because even though they're adults who only normally need seven and a half, that super output of energy requires a little bit extra sleep, more human growth hormone, more insulin growth factor one to control the cell's ability to take glucose in and convert it to energy, things like that, really important. And by the way, that's also good for reducing your risk of type 2 diabetes. A lot of people don't know this. In fact, a lot of people I stand in front of later on go and get a blood test because I tell them to. Yeah. Shift workers especially who do a lot of four or five hours of sleep, not enough to get the insulin growth factor they need. And I say to them, get tested at least once a year because finding out the easy way that you got high blood sugar levels is it's a little bit ordinary, but it's a lot better than finding out the hard way. And I have met countless people who have found out the hard way, oh, I'm about to lose a leg. Yeah. I didn't realize I had a tick bite under my toe and it's been there 11 weeks and it's starting to smell funky. Um, another guy that I have known for a number of years recently had a kidney transplant. Kept his old two that were working a little bit, but not enough to sustain life. He's got a new one donated from someone who moved on. He calls it Gino. Gino is his new kidney. <laughs> <laughs> Gino's keeping him alive, right? <laughs> Gino is his best friend. Seriously, he can live again and not be worried about dying every day. And, you know, all of this and a whole lot more, people with problems with their eyes. Uh, I even met a guy who had monthly injections under his eyeballs for type 2 diabetes. He, again, he found out the hard way. Please get tested once a year. If you're over 30, you should get tested. If you're younger than 30 and you do shift work, get tested. Yeah, I go to um, when I go to my doctor, which is not very often, just regularly, you know, every now and again, and yep. put those tests and stuff we have to have as adults. And every time my doctor will go, "Oh, time for your blood tests again," and I call them my old age tests. But we're not old, right? Like I'm, <laughs> I'm mid, maybe mid to mid on the edge forties. Um, <laughs> but it's really important to you can't monitor what you don't measure and and that can be the same yes. for sleep right if you're just ad hoc sleeping it's a little bit more difficult whereas if you start yep. measuring your sleep and that makes it a bit easier doesn't it it certainly does and can i give you a new name for your blood test your annual blood test yeah go me and control blood test like it because what i know i can fix <laughs> <laughs> like it <laughs> what i don't know can kill me <laughs> Um, so let me give you an example. A few years ago, a mine site was about to implement seeing eye machines in their trucks. And they said to me, and I'm doing a bit of this work um, right now at the moment with another group. Um, these are the forward thinking groups. Yes. We're about to test people's um, eye closures while they're driving trucks and we will stop. We will give them alarms if they close their eyes and things like that. That's all well and good. But first, you need a strategy of what to do with that person should they have eye closures. And secondly, you need a backup strategy to improve the sleep of those people if they need improving. Now, when I kicked this program off at this site a couple of years ago, in the very first night that it went live, unfortunately, the supervisor missed the training on the intervention. Whoops, big whoops, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, one of his operators that night had 27 eye closures in a 12-hour period driving a haul truck. And that supervisor didn't get him off the track. Um, and, and I'm not in, entirely blaming the supervisor. When operators of trucks have eye closures and they get this warning message, they go, I didn't fall asleep. Because you don't know. You only know that you're falling asleep if you wake up abruptly. And these, you know, audible alarm and a vibrating seat is what, what you get. Um, and you wake up and you just go, I wonder what that was. And then the supervisor calls up and you say, I didn't fall asleep. He convinced the supervisor that he never fell asleep once. And then we showed him 27 videos of eye closures. Anyway, the long and short of this is because we had already implemented a sleep improvement program as the backup of this, first thing we did was we tested his blood pressure. Oh boy, you are in big trouble. Your blood pressure is dangerously high. We also tested his blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. Again, he didn't know it, but he was a seriously dangerous high level type 2 diabetic. And he'd never known. Um, and the underpinning thing that was causing most of this, he had obstructive sleep apnea. 
which is where you stop breathing while you're asleep, usually be due to a large neck or a disfigurement in either the jaw or the esophagus somewhere. Long story short, we fitted him up with a CPAP machine, continue with positive airway pressure. Obviously, they gave him medication for blood pressure and blood sugar. Um, but after about a year, I'm talking to this gentleman just as a bit of a check-in to see how he's going. I couldn't shut him up. He was so happy. Oh, Dr. Nick, I've lost 25 kilos. I'm feeling so much better. My wife likes me again. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm driving again. And I'm no longer worried about my blood pressure and my blood sugar levels because it's all under control now. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want Naomi or any of her guests featured on your podcast or as a keynote speaker at your next event, you'll find their contact details included in the show notes. If you'd like to learn more about how you can work with Naomi individually or as part of your strategy to improve leadership in your business, then review the courses, offers and services at getupandgrowconsulting.com.au. So, you know, when you when you mentioned the drivers, that, that related to me and maybe you can give us some understanding of this, but I used to find when I was in transport in safety and we used to monitor uh, fatigue events and those sorts of yes. things with the DSSI machines, um, we would actually find it was the ones that were returning after their 24-hour break that had more often um, had experiences these events. And, yes. and we put it down, tell me if I'm right here, but um they because when they were driving even if it was up to their 14th day um or you know the 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 long consistent days they were in a yep. routine but as yes. soon as they had their day off it stuffed up their sleep routine and then they started having fatigue events absolutely it does and usually if they're a little bit short on sleep the first thing they'll do is they'll try and sleep in and catch up now that is good but it's also terrible because when you need to catch up you need to go to bed earlier but wake up at the same time. Keeping the same wake time is vital. When people sleep in, let's just say you have a good sleep into a nine o'clock in the morning. You know what your bedtime is that night? It's 10 past one in the morning because you have delayed your phase. You've almost, in fact, become a teenager again. Yeah. And then, of course, that night you go to bed at, say, nine to get up at five to go to work and you can't sleep for about four hours because it's not your bedtime. And they lay there stressing, getting sleep anxiety, getting grumpy and angry, and you can't sleep when you're grumpy. They might eventually get to sleep at about one and get four hours of sleep and then go to work on that and have a fatigue event. That is why that happens. You used to call it Monday itis. It's first day itis now. Any first day back. And do you know what's even worse than having a day off between day shifts? Having a day off between night shifts. Yeah, well, that's very true as well. And I liked what you said when we first caught up and and that's kind of where my leadership program was developed and came through is, you know, so many businesses and organisations, it's not just road transport, but it's everyone I go into, especially with skill shortages, we have these people that are really great technically and we say, hey, we want you to be a supervisor. Um, very mm -hmm. rarely do we give them the applicable training. So we might give them a cert yes. for in leadership and training, which is great, not dissing yeah. that. But mm -hmm. what about that? the subsequent training on people's behaviours, how the brain works, how you do yep. this and how you do that to really set them up for success? Absolutely. We really are short in that department. And I, I've said to several of my groups that I've, of employees, your supervisor is your best friend at work when you get tired unless they haven't done training on it. Then they don't know what the hell to do with you. And I have met supervisors who have lived with the consequence I was saying to someone, okay, I thought you were tired, but you're convincing me that you are okay. They've gone off and they've actually had fatal accidents on the road or at work. And the poor supervisors have to live with that. As a supervisor, I think what you should do is you need to demand that you learn enough about, you know, you got the management skills of people. That's one thing. Managing a fatigued employee is a whole different kettle of fish mm -hmm. because a tired employee is usually an pardon my nomenclature here, usually too dumb to be able to honestly say, hey, I am I need a 20-minute nap or something like that. They're so zoned out that they don't even know what to do with themselves. They'll just push on through because they're a good employee. Not always a good outcome. And the supervisor, yeah, the best thing a supervisor can do is look into the eyes of that employee and go, okay, yeah, you look tired. And if 
they getting out some of these checklists, I mean, fatigue assessment checklists, it's just pen and paper and it should be treated as just a tool that might be useful, but generally isn't that good. The best thing a supervisor can do to manage a fatigued employee is know them well enough to know when they're out of sorts. Know when they're a little bit grumpy, a little lacking in resilience, a little bit fumbly, bumping their head on things that they don't normally do. Yeah. Tripping yeah. up with the only rock in the workyard. You know what I mean? Those are the things that you go, you don't normally do that. How are you traveling today? Um, and again, the su that supervisor also needs to have a handle on what is good sleep, what happens when you don't get it. Um, and also they need to know what the company has available for that employee. Should it be long-term sleep issues? Should it be mental health issues? You know, EAPs. We need to sell the EAP better. And in my supervisor training, I really drive that message home. And I remember um, at one of the places I worked at, Groot Island, I'm happy to mention this because great culture, wonderful people, good leadership team. And the EAP went to site every Wednesday and people knew her. She was a lovely person and people confided in her. They trusted her. Anyway, I trained up 1,300 people in that workplace, including supervisors. And boy, did I sell the EAP. And I met her four months later at Mackay Airport. And she says, what did you say to those people? <laughs> I said, well, I might have sold you a little bit. She said, sold me. I am going on holiday. I am flogged. Yeah. I have had people call me up that I would never, ever think that would ever talk to me since you've been there. And I go, well, okay, my sales technique worked. <laughs> and, and I think that's the thing, right? We don't always realise there's someone to talk to and it doesn't always have to be that something's gone wrong. It's just sometimes just yeah. to, to let out. And I've got a client that um, gets me on their site uh, once a week for two hours and I just nice. sit there and we call it Let's Talk Sessions. And ah. You know, with the EAP for their business, like many of the big businesses, sometimes it can be weeks before you can get in with an EAP. So they've recognized mm. there's a shortfall there and they're giving yeah. people, you know, availability to someone right now, which is really yeah. helpful. Oh, absolutely. And I once reported to a mine manager that one of his supervisors um, went to an EAP for help and was put on a wait list for six weeks. You know, this yep. guy was in big, big trouble. When I spoke to that manager, he said, you have got to be kidding me. A blue collar worker finally puts his hand up and says, I'm in trouble. And he has to wait six weeks. I'm going to put a tender out for a new EAP. <laughs> yeah, oh, but it's so common. That's a, such is. a common thing that I hear. And um, I've got yeah. some other companies that don't have me on site, but they do have me just as a backup. And if their people can't get mm. in, they're like, can you just see them, give them two sessions until they can get into the EAP? I'm like, sure. Nice. Um, Absolutely. And and because we've got that relationship, I fit them in, mm. right? Because I've got my work yeah. hours, I want to work. And then I'm like, oh, I better fit them in. So I think it's finding people you can have those relationships with. Absolutely. But there's yeah. three questions that I ask everyone that comes on my podcast. So brace mm -hmm. yourself for them. Here we go. Um, but look, they're about, I just believe that the more um, we live life, the more we can see that some things happen for a reason and not everything's really um, bad for us later down the track. So they're kind of aligned around that. So the first one is what's the biggest obstacle you've ever had to overcome and how did that strengthen your connection inward? Is that a personal obstacle or in the work I do? Whatever you want to share. Okay. Um, my first big obstacle was when I was 14 and 74. Back then, it wasn't uncommon for us young whippersnappers to leave school and go to work to help support the family. Now, I had 13 siblings and a mum and dad at home. So I went off to work in a timber mill back in the days where eh, we weren't really that good to our employees. And to be brutally honest, after 18 years there, I honestly believed I was too dumb to ever get a job anywhere else. In fact, I remember the supervisor saying at one point when I said, I'm finished here, he said, you're not going to get a job anywhere else. <laughs> and luckily for me, one of my good mates who had already left called me up and said, hey, there is life after the mill. I'm now working in the prisons department. I said, oh, good on you. I thought you were as dumb as me. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that gave me the courage. Well, but the other thing that the reason, the main reason I handed my notice in, my twins were born and raising twins, especially through the night, mum and dad get very, very little sleep. And when you're working in a hazardous situation like a timber mill where 
that wasn't the safest meal. You could literally walk into sores and lose your life. And I'm being absolutely honest there. I was going home every night when my kids were about four or five weeks old, literally counting my fingers. And look, I can still, I've still got 10. They're all still there. <laughs> They're all still there. And that's why I left. Yes. Well, I could count to 10. I thought, maybe I should go to uni. <laughs> because I'm just so dumb, I'm going to try uni. <laughs> yes. <laughs> why not? And you know what? Love it. You don't even have to be smart to go to uni. You just got to bloody work hard. <laughs> that's it. And totally agree. Is, and I think people miss that, right? There's so many opportunities do. out there for them because we've got that brainwashing thing going on. Anyway, that's another we podcast. Do. Sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, no problems. And, you know, when I was at uni as a mature age, 32 years old, I was saying to some of the 17, 18-year-olds, it's not a bad idea to have a gap year, go and get a job, get a life, learn to deal with people, and then come back. And when you are learning this stuff, work out how to apply these skills dealing with people. Um, and I guess the other challenge that I have in my business is trying to convince some potential clients that their employees are at great risk of either hurting themselves, hurting other people, or becoming very sick. And I've had so many companies say, oh, we only work during the day, there's no problems. Okay, well, let me give you an example how that is incorrect thinking. I mentioned the 14 night shifts before. Yeah. At the same time, there were people doing 14 day shifts. One of the controls for these night shifters, I trained every single one of them. At the end of one year of permanent nights, four-day nights, seven off, four-day nights, seven off, for a whole year, 100 people. In construction, there was one finger injury. A man dropped his tool, went to grab it, stuck his finger on something, needed a Band-Aid. Yep. That's a bloody good outcome. Very good. For day shift, I said, hey, I noticed I haven't trained any day shifters. Oh, that's lower risk. It may be lower risk, but you are assuming they all sleep well at camp and they're not bringing problems from home. Oh, no, they'll be okay. Well, they weren't okay. In that same time period, they put a few people in hospital with serious injuries. And mm -hmm. what we've got to realise is that one of the controls for night shift is move safety critical work to day shift. Yep. So let's hurt the day shifters instead. Yeah. You know, so that's one of the things. And the, um, the other thing is health and education. Um, my biggest bugbear is that everyone who drives a car should have a high level of sleep and fatigue risk training simply because, uh, and I'll give you a good example. The other day I was in front of WA Police Major Crash Division, great bunch of people. I love working with them. I've done 15 uh, serious incidents, um, analyzing them. What I do is I write the research report that goes into the court with the charge of dangerous driving, occasion grievous bodily harm or death. Yeah, um, yeah. And what I did for them just last week was I said, time that you got an update because sometimes you'll do a nine or 10 hour day. You go home, you get your first hour of sleep, you get a call, you're going to be on the road for six hours. And then at the situation for another 10, 12, 14 hours, mm. you need some education. And a few of them agreed with me walking out of there. Every single driver needs that information because currently, and this is what I really, really want to get out on TV or as many podcasts as I can, we need to reframe the way we think driver fatigue. Mm. And I'll, if you've got time, I'll give you the evidence behind this. Yeah, look, we've probably got, we got another five minutes. Go, oh, cool. yeah, let's go. This is, if you've slept through this part, this much, be awake for this. This is the important, the real important up, Hello, part. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I have been in front of 32,000 people, as I've already said, and I ask questions to get the real information from real human beings. Um, and I say to them, how tired do you need to be before you will stop the vehicle and take a break because you are fatigued. Mm. And, and most of them, probably 95% will say, I've just fallen asleep. I've had an eye closure. I've yawned a lot. Um, I can't remember where I've been for the last 10 minutes or 20 minutes and a whole range of things, which indicates they are driving in stage one sleep. But in stage one, your eyes can still be open. The best way to think of this is the lights are on, but no one's home. Mm. Yeah. Now, most people won't stop until they know they're falling asleep. The trouble is, most people don't know they're falling asleep. They only know they have fallen asleep or they have failed to record memory, which means they've been in stage one sleep. What I would like to do, and I'm hoping to work with Main Roads and Walga and a few other groups, let's think a bit more cleverly about this. I'd like to work with the RAC on this too. Any groups that want to come on board? Um, 
we need to let drivers know that the best management of their driver fatigue is to try and average seven and a half hours of sleep every night. The more you do that, the safer you are and the less your brain needs to go to sleep to build more energy. That's the conclusion. <clears throat> now, even though I sleep like an absolute champ, I did a one and a half hour drive today. I stopped after about 45 minutes, not because I was tired, because I could. Yeah. That's the other thing too, time management. I can't say this loud enough. If we all had a better handle on time management, we would speed less. We would take less risky maneuvers. There would be much less carnage on the road and you can stop contributing to the road safety trust fund if you don't want to. You know, a lot of people think it's revenue raising. We'll just stop doing it. It's real easy. Currently, I'm a zero hero and I loved driving to work today going, I've got plenty of time to stop. I'm going to stop, have a little walk around. And I didn't need to. I wasn't tired. But the next half an hour was like, wow, you know, yeah, I just yeah. felt awesome. And I knew that if anyone on the road was a little bit erroneous, I could get out of the way. And that's yeah. important because sometimes you can't. Because um, you've got more better cognition, right, after you've had that Absolutely. Um, now, I actually heard at a conference once, someone at this conference gave a discussion on his investigation of incidents in the workplace and his question to people who didn't get hurt was, how come you didn't get hurt but everyone else did? Their response, my ass was twitching. Yeah. So in other words, it's like a sixth sense where when you are fully cognizant of all of your surroundings, you're like a meerkat. Oh, look, it doesn't look good. I'm just going to back off. I do this on the road. And that has helped me in a few occasions. The, um, that person delivering that session said, he called that pota, phenomena of twitching ass. <laughs> But it's so true and we we underestimate sometimes our ability to tap into that but yeah. it's things like you know moving eating well sleeping that allows yep. us to connect better with our body and the messages it's mm. telling us right absolutely all three of those things are so interconnected it's just incredible um and the last session at trans safe i spoke about eating healthy on the road um and just last night my wife come home and looked at the dinner i prepared and went wow look at that it was just big mix of Mediterranean, different colored veggies and had prebiotics that had probiotics. And on top of that, a lovely bit of grilled fish. <laughs> Love that you want to talk, Dr. Nick. Oh, so, absolutely. Another question I have is um, I also believe that there's a lot of gratitude that we can have for things that may go wrong but end up being wrong for the right reasons, if I said mm. that right. So have you got a challenge, something that's happened in your life, professionally or personally, um, that was really quite challenging at the time, but now you look back, you go, hmm, I'm grateful for that. Yes, I've in, in some workplaces I've had people going, uh, look, you know, we're just going to cut you down to one hour. We don't want you doing three hours. We want you doing one hour. And then you go to the workplace and that one hour turns into one and a half hours because people are turning up late. And it turns out it's the culture that's a problem. And one of these sessions, oh, incredibly challenging, I walked in there, you're the mongrel who's just changed the roster. No, don't shoot the piano player. Yeah. <laughs> Taking a lead from Elton John there, don't shoot me, I'm only the piano player. <laughs> um, they had just changed the roster sent me in to do some fatigue training, thinking that's going to help. But the people were so grumpy about the change. They didn't like it. And they just blamed me for it. And it was so hard getting through. And even at the end of that hour and a half, I'd say at least half of them come on board. So that took probably all of the effort that I could muster to go, soak it up, use your resilience, and let's turn this into something positive. And Pardon me, four or five years later, I'm back at the same group who are now doing it differently, about to do a roster change, but I'm there before they do it. Yeah. And some of the people remembered me. Hey, Dr. Nick, how's it going? Yeah, I still, I've been doing what you told us to do. And I'm going, okay. That is really warming. And I was talking to one of my good friends the other day, and I was saying that, you know, I did the Transay Forum. You know, I don't charge for these things because it's, it's good for the people. It's good for me to keep in touch. Uh, it's good yep. for me. To, I love talking to people. And, um, and when you're I, working with non for pro, non for profits and things like that, well, this is my thing as well. I just love giving back, and so yes. their 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 whole purpose is to give back. It's nice to jump on board their train, right? 
Yeah. yeah. I got one more question for you. Yeah. Um, what daily, weekly, or monthly practices do you do that strengthen your connection with your inner self? Because I believe when mm. we are connected with ourselves, one, we get the poda factor coming through pretty strong, but also it allows mm. us to show up better, right, in the world. And I mean, sleep oh. is one of them. So obviously you're going to say good sleep, but anything uh, else that yeah. you do. I love cooking. Yep. I am, I'm not a great chef, but I'm a bit of an artist in the kitchen. Um, I do experiment with things. Um, for example, tomorrow afternoon, I'm picking up three grandkids from school. You know how they get the munchies straight yep. after school? They're fang uh, well, hangry. That's it. Yep. Well, this afternoon, I made them some uh, chocolate fudge. Uh, what do you call it? That flat stuff. Brownie. Brownie, thank you. Yep. Sugar-free. Nice. And I added walnuts. Good brain food. And yeah. when I drop them off to their dad, they won't be killing him from being angry and hungry. Um, and I have had yet another win in the kitchen like yesterday with, you know, my wife. Um, yep. So that is a really, when I come home from a trip away, the first thing I want to do is cook a nice meal. Mm. The first thing, because I've been living on either pub grub or camp food or the worst is hotels because you get your protein and the stupid little thing that's supposed to resemble a salad. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. come home yeah. and chuck a heap of veggies together. Oh, here's another thing. Just give me one second. I do this. I find oh, pieces of timber and I don't know what it's ever going to be, but it looks really cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, I'm doing wood projects quite often. Um, I collect sapphires. I go, uh, when I'm in Queensland, central Queensland, if I get a day off, I go hunting for those guys. Oh, beautiful. Blue, green and yellow sapphires. Um, I, don't, I do a, bit, a little bit of prospecting for gold so far. Very little. Before we finish up, um, I'd love it if you could tell the listeners about your book. You've got, um, you're a oh. published author as well. We forgot to mention that at the start. So tell us a bit more about your book. Well, can you see that? Oh, uh, yes, now, now, yep. yeah. Now, The Wonder of Sleep Beyond Midnight. It's very hard to pick up on the camera. There you yes. go. <laughs> no, it is perfect. We got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, 27 years in the making. Um, it was actually harder to publish than it was to write. Mm. The first couple of chapters, a little bit scientific and could be seen as a little bit boring. But after that, we get into the fun stuff. Uh, there's a whole lot of information I've collected over the years from these 32,000 people who tell me their real life stories and what they get up to when they sleep. And some of it can't be said in the classroom. Um, let me give you a very brief example. Sleepwalkers don't always just sleepwalk. They sleep urinate. And I thought you were going somewhere else there because I've had, I'm not going to go too personal, but I've had a different experience of someone that was asleep, but they weren't walking, right? But, were, but I had no I idea. what you're talking about. I'm not allowed to talk about that one at mine sites because the word starts with S. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But yes. yeah, like, yeah, okay. And, um, so it's full of some interesting stories, case studies, that sort of thing as well. Oh, then. it's got tons of them. Um, for example, restless leg syndrome. Most people treat it with magnesium. The only problem with magnesium, you can overdose. And when you do, Comes out the other end, right? It comes Pretty out the badly. other end in a horrible way. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we got the, the gentlemen who wake up in the middle of the night and go and pee in corners, cupboards and fridges. Mm. And the ladies who get up and go and pee in drawers and swing top tidy bins. Mm. Just all the fun stuff yeah. I've learned. Yeah. <laughs> well, some and, people don't find that fun. <laughs> and if someone did want to reach out with you, chat with you about maybe coming and talking to their team or getting you to speak at one of their events or even just to connect because you're pretty cool well, to have a chat with, um, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Well, if I can just, if you can pause it there, if you're watching and get that QR code, it takes you to my website where you can contact me. Uh, it also takes you to my YouTube series. I've got, it's called The Wonder of Sleep, 22 short videos, yep. um, quite a few bits that we've spoken about today and more. Um, it also takes you to our sleep meditation music with our group known as Sleep Weaver. It's awesome music too. And I recommend you don't play that in your car. Good yeah, course, no, 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 no. Um, But through my website, which is um, beyondmidnight.org, uh, you can get me through there or you can send an email to Nick M at beyondmidnight.com.au. Pretty awesome. simple. And I'll put all of that information as well in the show notes for anyone oh, who's um, driving and listening to this. Don't worry. You can get the information at the, the bottom of the podcast and, and reach out to Dr. Nick. Oh, so one more thing. If you want to buy a book, you can go to the publisher's website. It'll cost you $33 plus postage, or you can contact me and it's $22 plus postage. So a little bit cheaper. 
if you want to buy a, a large amount of books for a, a whole group, and some of my clients have bought 500 or 250, and I tell you what, there's nothing better than delivering training and going, here's your book. Mm, oh, yeah. right in that? Yeah, sure. Go the hell to sleep. Yeah, and, and look, so you're telling everyone um, for our listeners of Catching the Octopus podcast, if you go across to his website, you're going to get a discount on the book. Look at that, a little special deal. You will deal. get a discount. <laughs> and if you want bulk, I'll give you a bigger discount. Awesome, guaranteed. thank you. Okay, and we can actually include that in the price of training for an even bigger discount. So yeah, great. Yeah. And I love well, training. That's my bread and butter. I love talking to people. And I love, I also say to everyone in my audiences, once you've finished the training, uh, you get this little booklet that I supply free of charge, a little 16-page book that the client prints out. Email address, website. If you have sleep issues after the session, you contact me and I fix you for free. Awesome. What a great deal. So Someone everyone will like be banging your door down now. Yeah? Sorry? Everyone will be banging your door down now. Um, well, I'd like to think that. But some do, some don't. Well, look, thank you very much for your time. I know you're a busy man. I know you've got lots on, and I really appreciate you making the time to jump on with me today, um, uh, Dr. You are Nick. welcome. Thank you. And I, I look what forward I to... do, and I really enjoy talking to you, Naomi. And I look um, forward to catching up with you at the next Transafe Forum or just I'll, around the tracks. I'll be, I'll be there. <laughs> Thanks for joining in and listening to this episode of Catching the Octopus podcast. It's been great having you here. And if you'd like to go and like and subscribe and maybe even leave a five-star rating if you think it's worth it, I'd really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you in our next episode.